let me begin by saying it's a great pleasure to speak here at uh, this, this uh, MITP summer school uh, uh, called the Amplitudes Games. Um, it seemed like a completely uh, necessary uh, design uh, for the, the logo of this, uh, of this school. Um, although, unfortunately, it's slightly, slightly not super connected to what I'm going to be talking about. So I'll be discussing uh, the double copy. Um, this follows on from a lecture uh, which Henrietta Alvan gave um, earlier in the school. So, uh, and in fact, I'm just going to begin by um, with a reminder of some of the stuff that Henrietta discussed, uh, in particular the KLT relations. So, um, now, Henrietta mentioned that the three-point amplitude in gravity, so I'll talk a little bit about what kind of gravity it is, but the, the three-point amplitude is the square of a three-point amplitude in Yang-Mills theory. So this is the uh, KLT relation of three points. So here it is in pictures, you know, gravitons are double copies, so double wavy lines, uh, the gravitons, uh, the graviton amplitude is just the square of the three-point amplitude in Yang-Mills theory. Uh, at four points, uh, there's another KLT relation. It's a little bit more complicated. It has, again, the structure of two amplitudes in yang mill theory and gauge theory more generally, uh, which are multiplied together with some kinematic factors, you know, some kernel more generally. Uh, and multiplying those two things together, you get the four-point amplitude in gravity. So this is an infinite set of relations. It continues for five, six, seven, many, many points. Uh, an infinite set of relations between various theories. Uh, so here I talked about uh, relations between gravity and gauge theory, but uh, as Henrietta mentioned, there's a whole set of theories, many, many theories uh, that are somehow interlinked uh, through this double copy story. Now there's a lot of different kinds of things uh, that one could discuss um, on a topic of the double copy. So I think uh, you know, I was just given the title of the double copy. So. You know, I, I guess I could do it whatever I wanted about the double copy. Now, there really were quite a lot of choices, uh, although fortunately I made different choices to Henrietta. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be slightly boring. Um, but things you could talk about, uh, for example, are what theories are related. You know, it's a big topic that people care about. You know, um, so it could be super gravities or double copies of super Yang Mills theories. You could talk about special Galilean scalar theories. It's, double copies of other kinds of scalar theories. There's a whole slew of theories uh, and we don't really know exactly what theories are related by the double copy. Another very popular topic are loops. Um, now we can use the double copy uh, at loops at least uh, uh, some level. I'll discuss a little bit about that, but it's not gonna be the main focus of uh, my set of lectures. Another interesting aspect of the double copy is, you know, why is there why is there a double copy? Uh, you know, um, sort of structural aspects of double copy that maybe we, we don't understand super well. Um, so those uh, that'd be one thing one could talk about. Uh, but what I'm really going to talk about uh, is you know what are the observables? Yeah, you know, what observables can we compute using the double copy? And you know I've got a sort of very maximalist point of view on this. You know, and there's this old lore that in uh, in quantum gravity, the only observable is the S matrix. So it's a little bit maybe hard, slippy to get a handle on what that really means. But um, you know, if you really believe that, then every observable is really something to do with the S matrix. You know, S matrix is amplitudes. So uh, at least in space times, which are somehow like Minkowski space uh, at large distances, um, you should be able to get every observable from the double copy. That's my point of view. Uh, and I'm going to discuss uh, in these lectures um, what sort of, you know, well, the sort of the direction I'm going to go, uh, what observables are, are, are interesting. In particular, I'm going to uh, aim at um, an interesting observable right now in, in gravity, which is the, the LIGO waveform, right? so gravitational waves, classical gravitational waves uh, from the double copy. That's uh, the direction I'm going to go. I mightn't really qu quite get there. I sort of suspect I won't, but um, we'll get pretty close. Okay, so the plan for the lectures, um, I have four lectures. So the plan uh, uh, today and this first lecture is just to talk about the double copy in its BCJ formulation. So Henrietta 
emphasize KLT, I'll emphasize BCJ, uh, at least in these early lectures. So I'll discuss this BCJ double copy, what it is, how it works. Um, in lecture two, I'm going to discuss, um, well, sort of two topics. So the first is color kinematics duality. And that's part of the, this BCJ story. Um, so I wanted to explain a little bit about how to think about it, at least how I think about it. And then I'll give you some examples of uh, double copy stuff at work uh, in, in, in the context of gravity. Now I'm gonna, you know, since I'm aiming towards Einstein gravity, these examples will be more, more emphasizing uh, Einstein gravity, uh, not just, you know, the simplest double copy, which usually includes axions and dilatons. Um, in the third lecture, I'm gonna start moving towards classical gravity. So I'll, I'll stop talking about just um, the double copy in its pure sense and start connecting amplitudes basically to classical gravity. Uh, and finally, I want to talk about um, uh, this notion that Schwarzschild is somehow a double copy of uh, just the Coulomb charge in, in plain all electrodynamics. Now this double copy, as I've said, is a huge story. So, you know, well, I'm not going to talk about all of it. There are many aspects that I'm not going to do just as to it all. Fortunately, uh, there is a huge review which folk can read um, if they're interested. So here's the here's the arch archive link. Uh, so I encourage encourage you to go there if you go. Well, if you're interested in aspects which I haven't uh, touched, touched, on all, touched on at all. Now I'll also be um, on the Slack channel. So uh, of course you're welcome to ask me questions, etc. Or if you're listening to these lectures live, then um, uh, you can just um, interrupt me uh, with questions as we go on. Okay. Um, so with that, uh, let me let me get started. Um, so I will start um, with um, well, just one comment which I wanted to make, really. Um, so it's called. Uh, so the double copy at zeroth order. So uh, just, just to answer a bit of a puzzle if you want. Um, and the puzzle is that, you know, we've seen that, uh, well, you've seen with, with Henrietta, as I just reviewed that the three point amplitude in gravity, uh, M3, is the, the square, it's just equal. Well, let me write a wiggly line. The wiggly line here is because I'm leaving out factors of couplings. I could put them in, but let me not do that. So, uh, but let me say M123 is uh, the three point amplitude in Young Mills theory uh, squared. Now, that three point amplitude, if you, for example, you open up uh, your favorite quantum, uh, quantum field theory textbook, or you just compute it because you know how to do it. Uh, this three point amplitude is roughly epsilon one dot P2, epsilon two dot epsilon three. So these are the polarization vectors, plain old, old school boring polarization vectors, momentum of one of the particles. Uh, uh, and you just add the cyclic permutations of one, two, and three. There's three terms. That's the three point amplitude squared. That's supposed to be the three point amplitude in gravity. Right? That's what this KLT relation is. Um, but there's a sort of puzzle at line zero here, uh, you know, which is, you know, sort of certainly bothered me when I first came across the double copy. Um, and the issue is that um, one thing I know about gravitational waves, classical gravitational waves, and it's one thing I want to talk about in these lectures, um, but also about gravitons, you know, gravitons and gravitational waves have polarization tensors. So what's going on? You know, I mean, there's polarization tensors. Yeah, so these tensors are two index objects, emu nu, and there's got to be one emu nu for each gravitational wave, each graviton. So here, um, so this m one two three in G or um, has got to be something like the polarization tensor of particle one. With some indices, the polarization tensor particle two, with more indices, the polarization tensor particle three, various Rents indices, uh, coupled into some something, you know, which you're supposed to compute from whatever, from 
you know, say you're say you've got the Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian, you could compute the Feynman rules from it. You know, it's a bit messy, but you can do it. Um, and that's got to be the amplitude. So it doesn't look a lot like that. I mean, they, you know, somehow they're supposed to be equal. So, so how does that work? And um, so, um, well, let me give you an exercise. So by the way, these, these exercises um, will have some overlap with some homework. I'll make a sheet of homework and I'll select some of these exercises, try and make something that's a sensible amount of homework. Um, but this is an exercise that you can do if you wish. Um, so and it is a show. So it's a, it's a relatively straightforward thing to do. You just any polarization tensor. Um, can be written uh, basically as polarization vectors, an outer product of polarization vectors. So if I got a polarization tensor e mu nu of some uh, graviton at momentum p, then this thing is some number times uh, positive helicity polarization vector, the same momentum, uh, maybe another number of times the negative helicity polarization vectors. Um, in other words, uh, for definite helicity, so if I have a definite helicity polarization tensor, so E, let's say plus plus, uh, that is going to be just an outer product of two polarization vectors, and the same for minuses. So the point about this is, is that uh, the polarization tensors here, I could split them up if they have definite. Uh, helicity into an outer product of polarization vectors. Uh, and once they fall apart into two, then you can reassemble this um, KLT relation. This, uh, this perfect square structure will fall out. So this is like the zeroth order double copy. Uh, this. And so the polarization tensor, uh, the state, you know, this is the thing, the, the thing that's the state uh, is a double copy of the polarization vectors in yang mills theory. So even before there is any dynamics, there's a double copy. The amazing thing about the double copy is that this, this is a kinematic thing, extends to all orders in the dynamics. That's what's amazing. Okay, now uh, to show this, uh, you'll need uh, you'll need some some properties. Uh, properties of polarization tensors. And so let me just give you a list of some of the properties uh, in case you're not familiar with them. So these polarization tensors are symmetric, uh, uh, they're traceless, and they have some gauge transformation properties. So I can always choose to make a gauge transformation with uh, some parameter zeta. That's uh, a vector linearized diffeomorphism. Get my indices right. Um, usually, we choose uh, uh, a gauge like Lorentz gauge. So you can use these conditions uh, to show this, uh, and the only trick is to think of um, is to make a basis of your vector space. So you can always make a basis from P, you know, the polarization vector plus or minus, and a gauge choice. That's the trick to show this. Okay, so with that sort of preamble, uh, let me move on to uh, the main topic of the lecture, uh, which is the BCJ double copy. Okay, so um, now the idea of the BCJ double copy is to write the amplitude in gauge theory, uh, the Yang-Mills amplitude, in a nice way. Uh, and once it's written in a nice way, the double copy, the double copy takes a very pretty form. So now the way to write um, our amplitude, so again, I'm thinking about yeah, Mills theory. It could be super young Mills theory. I'm thinking about a gauge theory. Uh, so we write um, the tree endpoint amplitude, uh, color dressed, so the full thing. Um, uh, so I'll put my coupling constants in here. Uh, so it's a sum of 
set of objects, n, c, and d. So I need to say, well, I need to say what these things are. So um, well, let me start with these n's. So this n is the kinematic numerator. So yeah, let me say kinematic numerator. It's kind of important that it's got kinematic there. So, and what that means is that it is something like epsilon.p. You know, you could get up from Feynman rules, it's a complicated thing. So it, it looks like epsilon.p, you can have epsilon.epsilon, epsilon, it can have p.p for different particles, pi.pj, whatever. Um, product of a lot of stuff like that, which you have to cook up somehow, you know, potentially by Feynman rules or by some more clever means. These color factors, ci, are the set of um, just your usual sort of color structures, F A B E C D E, you know, products of adjoint, well, potentially adjoint, um, uh, color factors hook, with the indices hooked together appropriately. So there's some, some set of these. Um, the denominators di are propagator denominators. So given some diagram, you can just read off propagator denominators, not three, three, that's two, three, say, whatever appropriate scalar propagator denominators you see in a diagram. And the sum here over i is a sum over diagrams. Um, so so the slight issues are not Feynman diagrams. So we just use um, cubic diagrams. That's to say diagrams made out of three point vertices. In other words, diagrams like this, you know, for various branchings like that, but uh, but there's no four point diagram, no point, no four point vertex in this set of diagrams. Okay, so we write we write our amplitude in this form. Now uh, you can always do it. I'll give you an example in a moment. Uh, you could always write amplitudes in this form, um, but we need a, an extra condition. Uh, you, we choose numerators, these kinematic numerators, so that, uh, so there's a condition here, if ci plus cj plus ck equals zero, then the kinematic numerators obey exactly the same identity. So we have to make choices of these ends that have this property. They don't always have that property. Sometimes they do, uh, but uh, they don't always. You have to hunt among the space of allowed kinematic numerators to get this property. But if you do that, um, then uh, the amplitude in uh, gravity is kappa over two to the uh, m minus two. Well, it's the same formula, just with two copies of the kinematic numerator. You can think about this as, you know, in different ways. So you can think about this as a double copy. There's two copies of the kinematic numerator, double copy. Or you can think about it as a replacement of color with kinematics. You replace the CIs with the NIs. How do you think about it? It's up to you. Um, but this is the uh, basic formula of the BCJ double copy. Now I should say what my kappa is. Uh, so kappa is gravitational coupling, uh, root 32 pi g uh, newton uh, in four dimensions. Okay, um, now there's a lot to be said about this. So let me make some comments. Um, and I'm going to generalize these formulae a little bit as I go along. So, uh, well, maybe one comment that's important is uh, this is proven at tree level. Uh, of course, I've only stated at tree level, but we have a proof. Um, so you can always find uh, numerators that obey these conditions in yang mills theory. You can, um, you know, uh, this double copy formula is guaranteed to give you the right answer. I'm not going to 
go through the proof and uh, it's it's reviewed in that, that review I mentioned a little earlier. So um, now secondly, um, well, the amplitudes I, I'm talking about or I have in mind at the moment are uh, Yang Mills or potentially Super Yang Mills amplitudes. And they're fully color dressed amplitudes. Uh, let's call them gauge amplitudes. So the, the, the gravitational friend then would be the appropriate, uh, you know, the appropriate gravity that you get by um, essentially counting the states in the double counting. So now, since I'm mainly going to be interested in classical gravity stuff, uh, gravitational waves, um, the, you know, if these A's here are just plain Yang Mills amplitude bosonic, then the gravity we're going to get um, is Einstein Um, Einstein gravity, but with a, a diloton, a scalar particle, uh, and an axion in, in four dimensions. Uh, well, in D dimensions, you get uh, this axion, which would be an anti-symmetric tensor. Um, you still get a, a scalar diloton. Um, yeah, maybe some other comment. Um, well, this is slightly to cover myself, I suppose. You've got to be careful about the overall sign. Uh, mainly because conventions differ. Uh, so I'll mention a, an example, uh, or one of the cases where that can bite you uh, a little bit later. Um, okay, now, um, one of the more significant aspects of this PCJ double copy is there's a, a loop generalization, or at least there's a conjectural loop generalization. So um, that runs by, uh, well, it's pretty, pretty obvious what to do. Um, let me copy this. Uh, you know, this formula looks a lot like the formula for uh, a tree amplitude in gauge theory. So uh, an obvious thing to do to go to loops is, you know, suppose you have something that looks like a loop amplitude in gauge theory. So let's say I've got L loops in D dimensions uh, so I'll indicate the measure schematically like this, d times l. And you get some symmetry factor uh, associated with the diagrams then, as we usually do. This will be a loop diagram, so let me put an l there, uh, and you'll get some adjustment to the powers of your coupling, um, which probably is 2l. Uh, very good. So that is... Um, a place to start, uh, and then the double copy formula would be to just upgrade the um, amplitude in Yang Mills theory to gravity by double copying the numerator. I can replace the color with the kinematics. So I just replace the C with the N. Uh, and this would then be, um, ooh, well, I guess this. I, Guess I better replace the coupling constants as well, the relevant coupling constants. So this would be the loop amplitude in gravity. Now this is conjectural in that there's uh, there's no proof as yet, at least that I'm aware of, that you can um, do this in general. There are many examples, pretty cool examples, um, of high loop orders. Uh, of a formula like this in loop in action, but it can be very tricky to find uh, numerators um, that obey the color kinematics duality. You'll still need that, right? You'll still need. Uh, you'll still need this. Uh, so it can be very tricky to cook up uh, a set of numerators that satisfies color kinematics duality and allows this double copy to go through. Um, but if it does, this is an extremely powerful formula um, and has been used to uh, study ultraviolet divergences in n equals eight supergravity, you know, at uh, well, up to five loops. You know, yeah, I mean, formula to be used with great care at five loops uh, and work more simply at four loops. Uh, but anyways, um, you can also use this formula in Yang-Wells theory, uh, so it works well. Um, 
in several cases. So there's also like uh, two loop examples of five points. Uh, again, tricky to find the numerators, but they can, that can be done. Okay. Um, now, one way you can view this is, um, you know, is, you know uh, well, uh, one, perhaps a good way to think about the Dillon copy quite generally is, you know, formally like, like these uh, quite generally is as um, good guesses or good answers. Uh, so you should check, you, know, you write down the double copy formula, but you might want to you know, make sure you really understand what's going on by looking at its cuts uh, when you can see what particles are flowing across lines um, going through the propagators to actually make sure you understand uh, the dynamics. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, uh, I think the last thing I wanted to say about this uh, uh, BCJ stuff is that there are asymmetric double copies that can be considered under a good idea. So, and the idea of an asymmetric double copy is um, that you can choose different gauge theories. So uh, you take this, uh, uh, this formula, uh, but you just choose ends from different gauge theories. So for example, uh, you could choose, you know, this n from n equals zero, plain old bosonic Yagmill theory, and instead of n twiddles from a supersymmetric Yagmill theory, say n equals four. So we've got n equals zero times n equals four on the gauge theory side, you'll get n equals four supergravity. Uh, so these asymmetric double copies can, uh, can actually be really quite useful. Another thing, you know, which I find helpful about these uh, in the context of classical gravity is to take uh, a numerator for bosonic, you know, so classical gravity say I've got some massive bosonic particle interacting with, um, interacting to, to gluons. And um, I could try to double copy that to a massive particle interacting gravitationally. Maybe then I care about the spin. You know, we do. Black holes out there um, have spin. So these things, you know, you know, that's, that's uh, the spin provides information about uh, formation processes of these black hole binaries. So we care about the spins. Um, now, so if you want to get uh, a spinning amplitude, one thing you can do, for example, is uh, double copy, you know, spin zero times the spin half. You can build up various different spins like that. Uh, so these asymmetric double copies are genuinely useful, um, not only just to uh, explore spaces of theories connected by the double copy, but to um, look at spin effects in uh, classical gravity. Okay, very good. Now, um, let me give you an example um, of how this, how this, this double copy story uh, actually works in practice. So, so one example that would be useful, uh, and one aspect I want to explain is how do you go about uh, putting um, an amplitude in this form? Where you have uh, a sum over just this, this set of uh, diagrams with three point vertices. So, um, as an example, um, well, let's look at uh, four points, just three. Um, so, um, well, the, the idea of the, the double copy then, or the starting point, is to write the four point amplitude like this. So, a sum over diagrams with three-point vertices, those are going to be three of them, um, which I can call the ST and U channel diagrams. So there'll be uh, the CS and S over S plus CT, oops, CT and T over T plus CU and U over U. Right, these STs and Us are just the Mandelstams, CS, CT uh, and CU are the, just the color factors you'd uh, you get from uh, the relevant diagrams. So this is like a T-channel diagram and then a U-channel diagram, looks like that. So uh, once I write these diagrams, you can get the color factors. Uh, you can also get the propagator, that's S there in my convention. So this is the color factor of the T-channel diagram, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, now, the question you might ask is, you know, if you're just thinking about Feynman diagrams, you know, I think, mm, this is weird. Clearly there should be a four point vertex. So, so the question is, what about, what do you do with the four point vertex? 
and let you get spotted from the five minerals. So the answer is, well, if you actually compute what this four-point vertex is, um, well, let me give some labels here for our particles and the colors. So this uh, vertex has, uh, you know, this form, this is a color factor. It's actually the color factor CS, and it's the color factor for this diagram. One, two, three, four. Now this uh, diagram was precisely that color factor. Now, uh, computing this four point vertex, you'll get this color factor times some dot product of polarization vectors. You know, epsilon one dot epsilon three, epsilon two dot epsilon four, just some dot product of polarization vectors. I'll call that XS. I don't really care what it is, it's just some stuff. Right. Uh, and there are other terms, the four point vertex has various terms. Um, but those terms will be at a, another color structure. It'll be the color structure of the T channel times some stuff that again is spat out by the Feynman rules. Uh, and finally, uh, there'll be the color factor of the U channel plus some stuff. Right? So and all you then do is rewrite this thing as CS uh, times uh, X xs over s plus ct times uh, t xt over t. I'm just putting in one in the form of s over s and t over t and u over u. This is not rocket science. And now I simply absorb these quantities, you know, this numerator, into what I meant by ns. Right? Um, so you might think ns is what's given by the the Feynman diagram with this topology, but it's not. It's what's given by the Feynman diagram of that topology plus this S XS. So you have to put those two together. So let's say, so this thing here, so we'll absorb that into NS um, and the same for these. Yeah, not UN and NU. Okay, so um, let me see. So that was sort of the example. It's an example of this arrangement of the diagrams. Um, but building on that, um, we give you uh, again another exercise. Um, so the exercise is a pretty obvious one at this point. Why don't you go ahead and compute NS, NT, and NU? And just, you know, you can use Feynman diagrams if you want, or other means, I really don't care. Well, let me say EG. You can certainly cut them up from the Feynman diagram. So that's a straightforward algorithm. Uh, and there's an interesting thing about that, which is uh, to show that NS plus NT plus NU equals zero. It just happens automatically. Uh, at four points that, uh, that this relation holds. Of course, it's true that CF plus CT plus CU equals zero. Uh, very good. Actually, you know, uh, mentioning that um, reminds me I should have, there was one point I wanted to mention back here. Uh, and that point is signs. So I tend to write pluses here, some other people write minuses. Um, and the sign um, really the point of, one could adopt is uh, whatever the pattern of signs is on the left hand side here that you should have the same pattern of signs on the right hand side and I'll, I'll make it open some more comments of these signs a, a little later okay now um let's uh connect this bcj double copy stuff back to the klt story we saw before so um, you know, this BCJ story uh, here at tree level should reproduce uh, this KLT story, which uh, I reminded you of back here. So, and what I'll do next is recover this identity uh, from uh, BCJ. Of course, there's something a bit funny about this identity, right? I mean, on the left-hand side here, we've got something that's permutation invariant. On the right-hand side, you know, I mean, it's, these things on the left-hand side are you know, gravitons or bosons, so you can permute them around as well. This is the full amplitude. Um, it has uh, full symmetry. 
On the right hand side here, we've got color ordered amplitudes. Uh, and these amplitudes break that symmetry, right? There's a specific ordering, one, two, three, four. This is a different specific ordering, one, two, four, three. So in a way, it's a bit funny that you have this, uh, this nice permutation symmetry here on the left-hand side um, and uh, this, this broken symmetry on the right-hand side. So similarly, um, uh, in BCJ, we have, well, contrary-wise, I should say, in BCJ, we have a story which seems to just uh, maintain, uh, you know, it doesn't break any symmetries. So there's no choices of particle ordering here. These are just the numerators you get. But to, get, to recover KLT, what I'm going to do is break that symmetry by making some choices. Um, so in fact, the easiest way to recover the KLT uh, uh, is to, um, well, let's say recover KLT at four points. So the easiest way to do it is to exploit the fact the, that these numerators uh, the numerators have gauge redundancy. Numerators are gauge dependent. So, uh, so I'll just choose some gauge where one of the numerators is zero. Choose whichever one I want. Um, that makes my life easy. So, um, so I'm going to choose, for example, nt equals zero. Okay, so then, well, from here, um, and u will be minus ns. So you see, I've made my life really very easy. I just have one numerator, uh, but that's good. I can write it out in a lecture. Very good. Now our amplitude, um, well, our gravity amplitude is pretty straightforward, but we also need expressions for the color ordered Yang-Mills amplitudes. Right? So KLT involves these color ordered amplitudes. So, we need expressions for them. So there was two of interest, uh, A, one, two, three, four. Now that amplitude is, um, well, convenient to notice which particles are beside one another. So one and two are together, three and two and three are together. And the color ordered amplitude, those are uh, the only kind of uh, factorization channels and any propagators I could get. So uh, I can write this thing as ns over s minus nt over t. Um, that sign just comes from the color ordering. Um, the one, two, four, three. Um, well, so I'm going to get it by uh, basically swapping uh, three and four. So ns isn't going to change, uh, but the nt will become nu. Uh, you know, so. Uh, that's consistent with this being a, you know, two four is a U channel propagator. Okay, now with this particular choice of numerator, uh, the expression simplifies. So uh, this is the one two three four ordering. This one here still has two terms. Um, I can pull out the ns right and use minus ns. So one over s plus one over u, um, and that. Uh, I can simplify further. Uh, actually, let me try to make this uh, a little bit clearer. I'll give myself a bit more space. I'll put this over here. So if I put these over a common denominator, I'm going to get SU downstairs and S plus U upstairs. S plus U is minus T. So this will be uh, there's a minus sign T over SU. Okay, so the double copy Double copy formula is, oh, I see I've dropped, uh, there's the factors of G squared here. If people are concerned about that. I've dropped the, the factors here. Um, well, I'm just gonna keep dropping them. Uh, you can restore them if you want. So the double copy is M. So now that's gonna be NS squared over S plus NT squared over T plus NU squared over U. But that's the one I just chose to be zero. So the double copy will be ns squared, again, one over s plus one over u, which is exactly the combination we had here. So we're gonna get the same, uh, the same algebra stuff, t over su. 
uh, and ns squared. Okay, now um, one of those ns's I can combine with this factor to get that amplitude, um, including the minus sign. That leaves an ns left over. There's one too many ns's here if you want. I just have one here, here I have two. Well, that remaining ns I can get from here. I can solve it in terms of amplitude one, two, three, four. So ns is simply s times that amplitude. Well, the whole thing will be one power of ns, that's s, amplitude one, two, three, four. And then everything else is amplitude one, two, four, three. So that is as expected from KLT. Okay. Um, so now the next topic I want to talk about is, is the origin of color kinematics duality. But uh, this is probably a good point for us to take a break. Um, so maybe we'll take a break for 10 minutes and, um, and then come back. Okay, great. Um, well, welcome back. Uh, welcome to lecture two uh, on topic of the double copy. So following on from last time, I'm going to just deepen, you know, start by deepening our understanding of this color kinematics duality story. Um, and then uh, I'll spend the rest of the lecture discussing a couple of examples. The examples will be relevant to us uh, in the uh, remaining two lectures. Uh, okay, so to begin with, um, well, let's look at this color kinematics. Well, I'll start by reminding you of uh, what this BCJ story was. So BCJ, so if we write the, uh, uh, an amplitude in say in yang Mills theory, uh, like this, so say tree amplitude, and I ci over propagator denominators. And if ci plus cj plus ck equals zero implies, well, I guess maybe we need one of those implications. Plus nk equals zero, then uh, the amplitude in gravity is, well, let's just get it by copying. Many aspects of lecturing by Zoom are quite crappy, but one aspect which is quite handy is how easy it is to cut and paste. Okay, so that is the amplitude in gravity. Okay, so now this bit here, uh, yeah, I could arrange things better. So this bit here, let me put a box around it. Uh, yeah, put a red box. This bit here, see if it makes a box, it makes a box, that's great. This is color kinematics duality. Or at least this is one of the things we call color kinematics duality. So the point of color kinematics duality is that the Kinematic numerators obey the same algebraic identities as the color. That's what we mean. The, uh, the duality is just uh, the statement that the algebraic properties of those kinematic numerators are the same as the algebraic properties of those color, of those color factors. So now at first glance, um, well, let's see, I suppose I glanced at this quite a lot. Um, this is quite mysterious. I think it's still mysterious. Very interesting. Um, so let me begin by some comments, with some comments about where this is going from. Why do we need this? So um, now, so one way to see that uh, you need something like color kinematics duality is to look at the issues of gauge invariance. And um, let's say, yeah, understand the need for color kinematics duality. Uh, see, that's a particularly bad M. Okay, so what I mean by that, um, uh, 
is the following. So let's say we start in, in Yang Mill series, so in the, you know, this side, the, the single copy side. This is sometimes called the single copy. No, it's sometimes called a double copy. You've got to say that the story of the double copy, it doesn't have the fanciest terminology, you know, single copy. It's a pretty low rent terminology. Anyways, and this bit here is the double copy. In the days when physicists were extremely well educated in Latin, it's clearly past. Anyways, um, so we're going to start here in the single copy side, so in um, in Yang Mill theory, uh, and we'll select some particle. So let's say let's say it has some momentum p, um, and then we we'll make a gauge transformation on the polarization vector of that particle. Consider the gauge transformation uh, the following form. So epsilon of p, so the polarization vector of that particle, we replace it by a gauge transformed friend, which is epsilon of p plus alpha times p. So these are these are Lorentz vectors. Let's make that clear. Alpha times p mu. Alpha here is an arbitrary complex number. Now that's just a change of gauge of the polarization vector. You can't stop me doing that. Right? Uh, it doesn't change the physics completely. Uh, completely, you know, I mean, the whole point is that this polarization vector, uh, this polarization epsilon prime, is just as good as the polarization vector epsilon, uh, as far as the physics is concerned. Okay. So now the trouble is that uh, even though that the the whole amplitude is gauge invariant, this is not the case that the numerators are invariant. The ni will go to ni prime, which are ni plus something. You know, I mean, there's going to be some part, some additional summand involving this alpha. I'll call it delta i. So this delta i. Uh, and in general, delta i is just not zero. So for example, in the last lecture, uh, I discussed cooking up the, the numerators for um, the four-point case from Feynman rules. You know, we just cook those up. They involve epsilons and epsilon dot p's. Um, there'll be an n s, n t, and n u. And if you make a gauge transformation on any of them, well, uh, all three will change. There'll be some change to n s, n t, and n u. So some set of delta i's gets um, gets induced this way. Uh, Okay, um, very good. Now, it's still though the case, I mean, this is part of the magic of uh, gauge theory, it's still the case that the amplitude, you know, the amplitude uh, is gauge independent. Amplitude is gauge invariant, of course it has to be. So, uh, so the amplitude, um, I can write it just as well in terms of these uh, ni primes. Sigma i, ni prime, ci over di. In other words, it's uh, g to the m over two, ni plus delta i over di. And now the, uh, you know, the ni bit, you want to find the ci and the di, that's the original expression we had for the amplitude. So it must be uh, that, uh, well, I guess so gauge invariance tells us uh, that this quantity, the remaining quantity here, so the sum over i times delta i ci over di has got to be zero. Well, not ni crush. Amplitude is not zero. Delta i. So this is just a consequence of gauge invariance. So whatever you know, however you cook up this alpha, you know, or you cook up this uh, gauge invariance. So whatever alpha you choose, whatever particle you select, uh, 
all these things will lead to different delta i's, but um, it's always going to be the case that uh, this sum is zero. So this is worth putting in a box, we'll put in a box. And I'm gonna give it a, a name. So I'm gonna call this equation star. Great. So that is just some piece of information that we have about these deltas. Now, it's worth dwelling on this point for a moment. You see, this identity holds no matter what the choice of gauge group is. You know, is it SU2 or SP4? Or, you know, I don't know, whatever gauge group you happen to care about, um, this is still going to hold. Now, all these gauge groups cook up different values for CIs. So for any group you want to pick, there's going to be some different selection of, of CIs. Well, this identity holds no matter what the CIs are. No matter what the CIs are, except from the fact that they come from a gauge group. So it must then be that this identity holds just by the algebraic properties of the Cs. So let's call it so star. So due to uh, the general uh, of uh, the set of color vectors. So now what are these uh, properties? So there's, there's two. Um, uh, Give this uh, so let's say general properties of C. So this is worth maybe highlighting. So these general algebraic properties are. I'm going to draw them, uh, indicate them diagrammatically. So uh, well, the first is let's say one. There's the Jacobi identities. So um, these things look like, uh, well, there's more than one way you can think about this, but let's draw it like this. Arg. So I'll recycle this diagram a few times. So let me cut, copy it. Okay, so now in the organization one, two, three, four. So what I mean by these blobs is, you know, these lines are connected into the rest of the diagram in whatever way they want to be. This, you know, these could be this could be some connected blob. You know, this this thing can all be surrounded by some big diagram, and there's just uh, some part of it we're looking at. And um, but the you know uh, maybe the one two three four should label the legs. Maybe that's actually better. Let me do that. Uh, okay, so here's Jacoby. Uh, two, three, one, four, plus uh, three, one, two, four. So that vanishes. It'll always vanish. It just vanishes by group theory. You know, the FABCs are coming from um, FABCs are coming from you know commutators. So you just expand the commutators. This is always true. And the second property which is maybe sometimes not really emphasized is uh, anti-symmetry. Two, three equals uh, negative itself. Uh, when you switch the legs, or you switch the sticky border. So these are the general algebraic properties uh, of color factors. They, they satisfy Jacobi identities and anti-symmetry. Uh, very good. So, okay. So that's just about this identity here. So it's coming from gauge invariance and it holds provided, uh, you know, it holds because these color factors satisfy these identities. 
Now let's look at the double column. So what I'm going to do is write uh, uh, the amplitude uh, like this. So take a, an asymmetric double copy. Uh, so this n twiddle is coming from wherever it wants. Uh, and this ni here, I'll perform exactly the same gauge transformation. So I'll replace this ni with the ni prime. So once I've gauge transformed on the single copy side you know, in Young Mills theory, I'll get this quantity here. So the amplitude, well, you know, this was the amplitude before, now this is the amplitude after. And of course, we want them to be the same amplitude. You know, I mean, it would be a pretty crappy story if the double copy only worked in specific gauges. You know, made a gauge change in the Yang Mill side and something, you got a different, anyway, it wouldn't make sense. So it better be that this thing Better be that this quantity here, copy equals uh, mm again, right? In other words, it has to be that. Uh, so we need the sum on i delta i and i twiddle over di equals zero. Okay, now. This identity here, I'll put this in box. This is something we need. Now it's not something we necessarily get, right? But it does look familiar. It should look familiar because it looks a lot like this identity here. So um, now this identity here and this identity here certainly look very similar. So given that our identity star holds only because of the algebraic properties of the color factors, then this identity here will also hold, the thing we want to hold, will hold provided the ni twiddles obey the same algebraic properties as the c's. Uh, let me go back to black. So and that is the, that's the sort of general point um, of color kinematics duality, that um, if we find numerators that satisfy the same identities, this Jacobi identity and this anti-symmetry, then we're guaranteed that this uh, potential obstacle to uh, gauge invariance will vanish. Right? So gauge invariance. So these kinematic numerators um, uh, to satisfy. So that's sort of the, the origin of this uh, color kinematics duality. And um, it's coming about from, um, from our requirement, um, you know, yeah, from the requirement of gauge invariance. So this double copy formula wouldn't make sense without it. Okay, um, now again, maybe it's worth making some comments um, on um, this color kinematics duality story. Um, okay, so. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot to say about color kinematics duality. Um, it's it's quite a mysterious thing, you know. There's maybe you know, um, you know. Well, in my opinion, um, color kinematics is still uh, not very well understood. You know.
Um, so the duality, you know, certainly it suggests the existence uh, of uh, some sort of algebraic structure, some algebra, uh, which, you know, which generates these kinematic numerators. Just as you know, the gauge group. You see, maybe generates is the wrong word here. You know, I'm trying to use a better word than cooks up. Uh, maybe cooks up is really the best, uh, the best way of putting it. You know, so some algebraic structure, you know, you know, whose rules somehow give you these ni's, uh, and whose rules guarantee that the ni's will obey Jacobi identities, just as the, the gauge group gives you uh, color structures from the FABCs, guaranteeing that um, the color structures will uh, satisfy Jacobi. Let me see what cooks up seems to be the best uh, phrase I've found. Um, now, uh, so I focused on um, color structures you know, which are generated, you know, which are associated with gauge bosons, adjoint, you know, adjoint like color structures. So in other words, so all color structures like CS, which was made out of an FABE and an FCDE. More generally, you can consider um, double copies involving um, matter particles in the fundamental. Yeah, or whatever representation you want. In some some representation, uh, it's called a representation capital four. So then there will be uh, additional sorts of color factors involving, um, you know, uh, involving T's. You have, you know, TA, you know, could be contracted on some indices, something like this. And um, so now uh, the color kinematics duality will still apply um, when these kind of objects satisfy um, satisfy you know, some sort of uh, identity. So group theory identities. So for example, commutators of Ts or Fs. So if you have matter particles, well then there'll be commutators of color factors involving these that will give you an adjoint color factor. Um, and again, in the double copy, you, you need the color kinematics duality. Uh, and it's just for the same sort of reasons that, uh, that the color kinematics duality is going to uh, guarantee you that uh, you'll get gauge invariance. Okay, um, now maybe there is a, a final comment which I can make. Um, so that is, um, there's one case, um, there's uh, one very distinct case uh, related to what we just talked about where color kinematics duality is quite well understood um, and is related to uh, some algebra. So that's in um, the context of what's called a self-dual. Uh, Yang-Mills theory and gravity. So self-duality, what it does, uh, you know, so self-duality, say in Yang Mills theory, is just the, the statement that um, the the f the two form f is um, it's it's dual. Now in Minkowski space, you might have to put an i in here to make a, to have it be real. Um, similarly, uh, or in other words, uh, in terms of indices, something like this. And there might be a two, 
uh, it's probably a two. Uh, what side is the two is the next question. Is it there? Maybe what I'll do is put a twiddly. Great way of getting around that problem. Um, F mu. Uh, and similarly in gravity, uh, you can impose a self-duality requirement that uh, basically, well, let's take it on the same side. Oh, maybe I shouldn't. Uh, I'm going to put a twiddly. Um, or alpha, beta, mu, mu. Okay, so, well, that's the maths there. So there are some equations that you impose. Um, these equations imply the equations of motion. Um, however, they're stronger than the equations of motion. Now, uh, in young Wilson and gravity, we know there are two polarization states, right? plus helicity and minus helicity. Now, what this uh, self-duality condition does essentially is sets one of the helicities, it just throws it away. And you're left with just say all plus. You have plus helicity uh, gluons and plus helicity gravitons. So of course you still think that there is a, a double copy story there. Uh, the nice thing uh, that happens in these self-dual theories uh, is that the equations of motion, and these equations of motion here, and this one and this one, uh, can be expressed in, in terms of scalar fields. So you have to uh, you do this by introducing uh, essentially a, a prepotential, so something that differentiates into the gauge field. So so uh, so so there's some phi. So some derivative of the phi will be the a, and the equation of motion for this phi is, um, well, let me get into twiddlies, uh, ig, so there's some derivative in terms of some directions. So these are like concordance. So that's a uh, gauge theory. Uh, and similarly for gravity, uh, so two derivatives, uh, a scalar field will be the metric perturbation uh, and the equation of motion can be written uh, in terms of a Poisson algebra. So this is a Poisson bracket. Okay, now the point of this um, uh, is, well, firstly, these kind of look very similar, these equations. Uh, that's really just the point I'm trying to drive out here. They're very similar equations. And moreover, the similarity is you replace, you know, a commutator. This is just the matrix commutator. This phi is a matrix, just like that A. So that's a matrix commutator. You replace that matrix commutator by a Poisson bracket. Um, now, you can't, well, uh, you know, I'm talking about equations of motion here. You know, we make more connections with uh, equations of motion uh, and amplitudes. But firstly, these look a little bit different. However, you can compute, you can solve these equations of motion perturbatively. Uh, and the perturbation, and the perturbative expansion of equations of motion uh, is closely connected to Feynman diagrams. So this thing does generate Feynman diagrams, Feynman-like diagrams, with one off-shell leg, basically. Um, now, those Feynman-like diagrams uh, between these two theories, again, it's exactly the BCJ double copy story. Or you can uh, upgrade diagrams here to diagrams in gravity by replacing color with kinematics. Uh, the kinematics is associated with this Poisson algebra. Now the, the, the actual kinematic algebra in, in this theory is a, it's a certain diffeomorphism algebra. So that is uh, the color kinematics duality. So well, very nice in the self-dual theory, um, and that's sort of provocative, but it's not so well understood um, in general. Maybe some progress recently, though. Okay, good. So that's what I wanted to say about uh, color kinematics. Let's now do some examples. Um, 
So the examples uh, I want to discuss, you know, have a little bit of uh, color kinematics in them, um, but I want to skew it a little towards uh, the remaining lectures, uh, particularly the next lecture, uh, when I'm going to talk about um, classical gravity uh, from scattering amplitudes. So what I want to do is, of course, get the, the gravity part from uh, the double copy. Uh, but for my particles, you know, I'd like to actually have a master done, you know, the, you know, aiming to talk about things like black holes, so black holes of masses. So um, I will begin. Um, you know, the first example will be uh, a four point again, four point amplitude, but now massive. I'm going to switch on some masses. Um, tree level. Uh, well, we could go beyond tree, but probably doesn't fit in the lectures. Um, and I really want to do Einstein gravity. These LIGO folk aren't very impressed. Well, actually, they're surprisingly happy to talk about dilettantes, but you know, it's at least uh, good when we can figure out how to do a plain old Einstein gravity. Okay, now switching on the mass, uh, it's not something I've discussed. Uh, potentially, Henrietta talked about it in her lectures. Um, at some level, uh, switching on the mass is easy. So for example, uh, the double copy is a d-dimensional story. So I can switch on masses using uh, some kaluza klein mechanism. You know, say my particles are really in five dimensions, give them a mass and you know, some momentum in the fifth dimension that acts like a mass in the fourth dimension, and then just take some decoupling image. So in this way, we'll get a, a massive four-dimensional you know, particle from um, massless five-dimensional particles. So the mass is not really such a big deal. Um, however, I'm going to think about massive particles in some representation R uh, in, uh, in, in the single copy in yang Mills theory. So um, what we should do uh, is double copy and then check that we know what we're doing. Uh, and that'll be particularly important in order to disentangle the um, axions and diltons that the double copy can introduce um, in, from the uh, graviton button that we really want to keep. Okay, now um, uh, I'm gonna take, in fact, uh, two different massive particles. They can have different masses. Again, I'm thinking about black holes, you know, certainly I'm allowed to scatter black holes with different masses. So uh, the diagram, let me draw it like this. The diagram that we're going to care about is very easy you know, in terms of Feynman diagrams. So I'll just compute it, in fact, from Feynman diagrams. Uh, okay, so I'm going to put in particle, you know, one on this side. So this will be particle one in representation, uh, representation or one. This will be particle two in representation or two. It'll have an initial momentum P2. P2 prime, P1 prime. I'm going to exchange some momentum Q. And uh, maybe worth reminding folk what is the Feynman rule. Uh, maybe you don't keep it in your head. Uh, so this has, um, well, so this is some gluon with an index mu and uh, the red index A. Oh, this is pretty old school still. Uh, it's always slightly embarrassing to, you know. Uh, lecture on tree amplitudes, but anyways. Um, yeah, get some mileage out of it. Um, now, so this thing is, there's an I, there's a factor of the coupling, there's a TA, and then really the guts of it is P1, P1 plus P1 prime uh, index B. Okay, so um, with that Feynman rule, we can just write down what the four point amplitude is. It's got an IG squared. And um, just from these things here, it has TA of particle one, you know, that TA times TA of particle two. Um, now, on the left hand side, uh, we got P1 plus P1 prime with an index mu. Uh, in between, there's a propagator. Now I'm gonna work in Feynman gauge, but I'm gonna keep this eta mu running around the place. It'll be helpful for us later just to keep it explicit. 
So that is just a metric tensor, e to mu nu, in my notation is metric tensor. Uh, Q squared is just the momentum of the propagator. And then on the right hand side, we have uh, just this factor here. Okay, now this is a double copy and I'm actually gonna try and get all the factors right, more or less here. So we'll need to um, take a little bit of care. That's why I put the I here. And I'm using a sort of more traditional phase convention here where you know the matrix elements of this T operator, S is one plus I T, the scattering matrix, the matrix elements of the T operator are the amplitudes that gives you a phase convention. So um, I should stick to it. Anyways, so now yeah, our four point amplitude is oh, with some algebra, that's gonna be a G squared, some I cancels, and well, let's say it cancels that I, there's two more I's, because it cancels the minus sign. Okay, so, so it's pretty easy. P1 plus P1 prime, mu, e to mu, nu, P2 plus P2 prime, and nu. I think I might want to copy that over Q squared. Okay, now, um, so to, to do the dupe, double copy, well, we need to identify the numerator. It's essentially just this. Uh, this is some color factor. And um, you know, there's just some couplings, propagator, denominator. Uh, but first uh, we should take care of um, a slight bit of nitty gritty. Um, that is the, uh, in the amplitudes world, uh, we tell not to use uh, the color factors from standard textbooks. So we replace the color factors with uh, twiddly color factors, factors of root two. So they just, uh, that just gobbles up some root twos you would find elsewhere. So, um, so in terms of that, our amplitude is, well, it's very much unchanged. Uh, t twiddle one, t twiddle two, there's a factor of hmm, definitely not a quarter, definitely a factor of a half, uh, and our numerator. Okay, so now, uh, now this is g squared, some color factor, I'll just call it c, some factor n over q squared. So the color factor is just this one. And N is this thing which I have stored here. Okay, now what about color kinematics duality? Uh, well, I only have one color factor. Not much you can do with it, right? You know, there are no identities. You know, I just have a color factor C. There's nothing to say. Color kinematics duality is vacuous. There's no uh, identities that uh, amongst these C's, you know, it's just one C. So similarly, I just have one numerator um, and it should then be that uh, the double copy, let's just go ahead and square this. So I will get kappa over two squared, um, our numerator squared. That's, that's the job done. So that's a four point amplitude in gravity. Now the real question is what gravity? What gravity have I, have I done with this, this, this uh, straightforward double copy here? So um, well, let's, let's take a look uh, to figure out what, um, what kind of gravity is actually here. You know, I mean, this is uh, at the level of diagrams, it's something like this. So the question here is, what is propagating in that line, those lines? What's propagating across uh, from this left-hand side to this right-hand side? Is it a graviton? Probably, yeah, it's gonna be a graviton. Uh, it's gonna be a graviton because there was a, uh, a photon here, that photon associated with some polarization vector. I double copy the polarization vector. So I'm gonna get something in Felicity too. So I'll get a graviton. The question is, do I get dilettons and axions? So to see how this, to see what we've got, we'll um, see what modes are propagating. 
uh, so we can examine the factorization channel. So what I mean there is I'm going to take uh, the limit as q squared goes to zero of q squared m. So that means I am um, essentially I'm cutting I'm cutting this propagator here. So the propagator is now it's on shell. So this uh, this object carried momentum q. There it was. So uh, now the momentum q is going to zero. So this thing is on shell. I've removed the pole by multiplying cos by q squared. So really what I want to do is see that this thing is breaking up into a left and a right amplitude. And what I especially care about is what are the polarization vectors of the states uh, that, that being tied together here. Okay, so, um, well, let's, we have an explicit formula, so it's easy to work out what, uh, uh, yeah, what is running it through here. So I've got a, oops, a kappa over two squared um, times uh, our numerator uh, squared. Now it's convenient to write that as kappa over two squared. Uh, and then I'm going to rewrite it like this. Prime mu prime, eta mu nu, just writing out the product, p2 plus p2 prime in mu, p2 plus p2 prime mu prime, that is a two. Uh, and these ones are ones. Good. Very good. Now, that's what we get. So what would we like to get? Well, well in Einstein gravity, so the propagator is, uh, so it'll be one over Q squared, and then it'll have the Dedonder numerator. The under gauge numerator plus gauge with some gauge terms. So the under gauge numerator is um, now. Let me see. To get my indices lined up, I'm got mu and a mu prime, mu and mu prime. So I'm going to get eta mu nu, uh, but it is symmetrized mu prime mu prime, and crucially, there's a subtraction term. Um, that's not the right subtraction term. Subtracts a trace. Delete. Eta mu mu prime, eta mu mu prime. There's a factor uh, two over d minus two there in, in d dimensions. Okay, now, uh, so on shell, so this numerator, copy. is the sum over helicities. So H, which can be plus plus or minus minus of, uh, again, let me get my indices right, of a polarization tensor of a graviton. And I guess it's uh, the opposite of the other side. So, uh, so this corresponds to a non-shell graviton on this side. You know, this one says the on-shell graviton on the left. This is the graviton on the right. Um, and uh, on shell, uh, this uh, combination of polarization tensors takes this form. Right? So this is the kind of thing I would like to be seeing across my cut. Right? I mean, if I saw this thing across here, I could decompose it into a product of two graviton polarization tensors. And I'd understand that I just had gravitons propagating. That's not what I got. We got eta mu nu eta mu prime mu prime. We got this bit. Uh, hang on, let me. We got this bit, which is the same as that bit. Um, we didn't get these two bits. Right? Now this bit here, the second bit, isn't a big deal. Uh, this just uh, symmetrizes on mu and mu, uh, mu and mu prime. Um, uh, yeah. So this, I could get the second term from here by symmetrizing on mu and mu prime, uh, and this term. Is already symmetric under that. So, so basically I've got both of these, but I definitely haven't got that bit. Uh, 
So what that's indicating is we have a scalar mode propagating. So there's a dilaton. There's no axion because of the symmetry, um, but there is a dilaton propagating uh, in this double copy. So this isn't quite the double copy we want for Einstein gravity. It's a double copy in the gravity plus axion plus dilaton theory. But there is a well, very simple way to fix that, right? Um, if I really want to get gravitons, I really want this uh, projector. So all I need to do is replace uh, this projector by this one. Uh, so I'm going to fix by replacing uh, this thing. Copy, paste uh, by uh, this thing. And I probably need a factor of two. I'll do that. Okay. So in other words, um, the Uh, will be uh, uh, so how will I make this easy for myself? Um, ooh, so I missed a sorry, so I missed a factor here. Um, my n, ooh, I missed an important factor, so I missed my factor of two here. Uh, so I missed that half. So there's a, a factor of a quarter here. I'm going to put it there. So it's just by squaring that two. Um, I picked up a Y, which I don't need. Makes that four. Um, and what I really need to do, actually, I, I guess the simplest way of doing this is in fact to delete all of this stuff. If I went over Q squared, that a quarter, this is a half. Um, and then I'll get P1 plus P1 prime mu, P1 plus P1 prime mu prime times the Donda propagator, copy, paste, uh, times P2 plus P2 prime uh, mu, mu prime. All right, now, uh, so, so we'll use this uh, in the next lecture. So there's one thing to take care of, or no, uh, we'll see in the next lecture that the Q uh, of the uh, momentum transfer in the case we care about. Uh, so we're going to use it in some co classical context. So then this momentum transfer Q is going to be very small compared to the P's. Um, so if Q is negligible in the numerator, so then this M will be uh, kappa over two squared. Uh, one over Q squared, I have an eighth there. Now, if uh, worth remembering that P1 prime was P1 plus Q, P2 prime was P2 minus Q, not that the sign really matters. I'm going to neglect these Qs. So the P1 and P1 prime will add, give me a factor of two. So I guess two, four, uh, like a factor of 16 upstairs times, um, P mu, P1 mu, uh, sorry, mu prime, mu, mu prime, and then times this Tadondra propagator, copy, paste. Okay, uh, and then that is just a kappa over two squared, one over Q squared, a factor of two. Okay, so when we dot these things in here, I'm gonna get, um, uh, P1 uh, dot P2, so that's uh, mu nu, so it'll just dot these things together. I'll get it squared from two places. This will give me the same thing. So there's a factor of uh, two. Uh, and then this one here, well, I get uh, P1 times P1, so that's just minus M1 squared. So, uh, and all that story about removing the dilaton just introduced that minus m1 squared m2 squared. Um, so it's there in general relativity, so we'll use it in the next lecture. 
Okay. So that is uh, the first example. Um, I'll give you a second example. Well, this is going to be a bit more example slash exercise. Uh, so this one's a fun one, five points. Uh, three again. So the amplitude in this case will be so a massive particle uh, radiating uh, a graph, uh, uh, a gauge boson. And we're going to double copy to uh, the same thing radiating a uh, graviton. So this amplitude is actually relevant uh, for black hole scattering. So this five point amplitude computes the waveform at leading order uh, in black hole scattering. So, um, well, it's a tree calculation uh, at leading order. You just have trees, uh, loops at higher order with trees at leading. So there are five diagrams. Uh, so again, these particles on the outside and uh, the solid legs are massive particles, representation one on the left, representation two on the right. Um, and our five diagrams are obtained by, actually, let me copy. Uh, so the five diagrams are just obtained by putting the, uh, the radiating particle on uh, the five possible places it could be. So, and then two more where, you know, it's just uh, the radiating gluon is on the other side. So correspondingly, there are going to be uh, five color factors, C1, C2, C3, et cetera, uh, and five kinematic numerators, N1, N2, N3, et cetera. Um, straightforward to write down what the expressions for the color factors are. So, so if I call them, so there's a particle one, particle two, particle one, two. So C1 will involve, uh, yeah, let me say that the gluon carries away an index A. Uh, okay, so putting on my arrows. Um, in this first diagram, I'm gonna get a T1 with an index A and another T1 here with an index B. We could probably really put twiddles on these. Uh, dotted with a T uh, of particle two. Now I should say, so that's a matrix product there. So there are matrix indices being contracted here. Um, between one and two, uh, well, this is in different representations, so it doesn't have the same matrix indices anyways, but uh, so the only contraction is that, uh, that uh, index B there, the adjoint index. So similarly for T2, uh, well, similarly, but just different because we get uh, to the interaction point first. So T1 twiddle B dot, and then continuing down there, T1 twiddle A, uh, and then T2 twiddle B. Uh, and finally for C3, well, we'll get uh, T1. Um, uh, there is, well, there's some delta here, but there's an FABC. So let me call it, uh, yeah, that doesn't have index A anyways. So B, F, uh, why is it right? B, A, C, twiddles. We usually use a slightly different uh, convention also for the Fs in amplitude. So I'll put a twiddle there. Uh, and finally here, uh, a T2 twiddle, uh, B, sorry, C. Okay, so these are three of the color factors, or there are two more, uh, but uh, now, if you take uh, C1 minus C2, you'll find that you've got uh, T1 twiddle A, T1 twiddle B, that's a matrix product, T2 twiddle B minus just the other ordering of the uh, on the one side. So in other words, this is the commutator of T1 twiddle, same representation of course, T2 twiddle B, so and then up to a number, uh, which I'm not going to get right right now. This is FABC, T2 twiddle B, T1 twiddle C. So in other words, this is up to a number, C3. So there is 
some color algebra here. Correspondingly, uh, in the double copy, we need uh, We also need uh, uh, exactly the same thing. So we need n1 minus n2 up to a number, same number, uh, n3. So, um, well, exercise. Uh, you can go ahead and compute these things. So compute n1, n2, and n3. It's the same for, you know, I, I haven't talked about the two other numerators, four and five, it's exactly the same story. It's just left with the right, they're symmetric, no point in worrying about it. Where you compute n1 and n2 and n3, and then show color kinematics duality holds. Actually holds automatically. Um, so you don't have to seek any numerators, holds automatically if you just use Feynman rules. Um, but uh, let me give you, well, those of you who say, might make this one of the homeworks, but um, as a hint, it's a good idea to choose a good gauge. Uh, choose. A sensible gauge for external polarization vectors uh, to simplify the calculation. Thanks, the algebra much easier. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say today. Um, next time we will come back to, uh, to this amplitude and we'll use it um, to scatter uh, black holes. Um, this amplitude, maybe we'll manage to get to, um, maybe a bit ambitious, but this would be the one for uh, the radiation from black holes, black hole scattering. Um, but uh, our, our first goal uh, in the next lecture will be to see how amplitudes have anything to do with uh, black hole scattering. Okay, thanks. <laughs>